this is the Dynamics Lab setup. I just copy the figure over so that I can uh, use that as a prop to say talk about how this um, this represents the setup that we'll be working with. So I'm going to use the label uh, consistent with the 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 lab manual that you not lab manual worksheet that you briefly saw with the mass one on. Um, on the level surface and mass two that's hanging. So let me use level M1 for the cart and M2 for the hanging mass. Your lab uses different labels, so remember to switch over. And um, I will go on to answer this question. And um, well, let's see. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, sometimes uh, what I like to do in demonstrating the standard strategy is you can actually kind of jump right into standard strategy without knowing what the question is. Because the point of the standard strategy, which I'll write down as a reminder for myself, these are the standard strategy steps. And the steps are, number one, you draw the free body diagram. Number two, you um, define coordinate axis. And what you are really looking for is to make sure that at least the one of those axes are parallel to the acceleration. This will simplify your steps, um, uh, steps number, um, step number four especially. Step number three, which, um, well, step number three, which we don't need to worry about for this question, but I'll write it down, is to break forces into components. And finally, step number four is to write down Newton's second law equation. And I'll write in vector notation as a reminder that I need to treat separate directions separately. And um, I guess this is how I usually write it, but let me actually do something uh, different and write it in the format that highlights cause and effect relationship in Newton's law more clearly. The version that highlights the cause and effect relationship in Newton's law more clearly is actually this one, which says that acceleration is the net force divided by mass. And I mean, you know, it's algebraically equivalent expression. Uh, what's important here is the conceptual part, that it's not the acceleration causing the force, it's the net force causing the acceleration. So, um, yeah, but algebraically they are equivalent. Um, so this is standard strategy. You can almost kind of get started on it without knowing what the question is. If you uh, have the setup that's given and you understand the setup, you know whether there's another applied force or not, then that's kind of all you need to jump right into the standard strategy. Um, and sometimes I do that, or I used to do that in lecture as a kind of demonstration. But for the sake of clarity, for this particular question, let me first write down the, what the question is that it is we are trying to answer. What it is we are trying to answer is one, what is the acceleration? So what is the acceleration? And Properly speaking, this should be really what is the acceleration of the cart and what is the acceleration of the hanging mass. But I hope as you, um, as you stare at this setup, that if you look at acceleration of the cart as pointing towards the pulley, and you look at acceleration of the hanging mass as pointing away from the pulley downward, then the magnitudes of these accelerations should be the same. So once you recognize that, then we can just use one single letter to stand for the magnitudes of those two accelerations. So that's one question that we definitely need to answer. And the other question, which if there's time you might get to, is this one, uh, which actually your lab gets into. And so, um, and I think the, the worksheet actually used to, or did. So let me just double check. Yeah, and the tension, oops, I need to switch my device. And the tension in the string. So uh, let me also solve for tension since uh, in the face-to-face -face lecture, we used to cover the tension in the string as well. 
So we are asking the question of what is the acceleration and what is the tension? So these are my questions one and two. So, um, so let's get started. And having stated those questions for the next uh, five to 10 minutes, I'm kind of just ignore them and just to work, work my way through the standard strategy. As I was saying, um, it kind of doesn't matter what the question is. These are the exact same steps you would be going through regardless of the questions. Because <laughs> it's the same step you have to go through to fully flesh out the physical situation that you are given. And this is really, and you know, when you have worked through the standard strategy, it doesn't actually solve the question. It kind of sets you up in a situation where you can now, you are in a position to quickly answer any questions that someone might, might ask. So let me go through this standard strategy. The first step is to draw free body diagrams. And this uh, setup has a multiple uh, object. So I'm going to need to draw multiple free body diagrams. And this uh, uh, reason, that this is the strategy uh, most commonly in use with the multiple body problems is why the portable TA calls it multi-block strategy. So let me draw the uh, free body diagrams. And I guess uh, uh, I hope it's not too confusing because I'm going to be swapping the left to right order. But um, let me just, I'm just going to draw the free body diagram for M1 first and free body diagram for M2 next. It's just less confusing for me to go in the order of one and two. So, um, so free body diagram, what it is, it's diagram of forces on the object. So each time I'm drawing forces on the object, and I'm asking myself this question, did I draw all the forces? So I look at this card, and I realize that it must have at least two forces. First the force is gravity. There's always gravity. So I, I like to gra draw gravity every single time. Even in the cases when the gravity doesn't play um, it doesn't result in anything interesting. I still want to draw it. I want to make sure I didn't forget any forces. And two, this is where I have to notice that there's a string attached to the cart. So I infer that there must be a tension force pulling on the cart. So, all right, uh, for the string is pulling it to the left. So the tension force must be to the left, T. And I guess, um, let me label it T1 so that I'm practicing good problem solving hygiene, uh, establishing good habits. And I'll, I'll be modifying that in a little bit, but I want to give it a separate label to start with. So after having drawn this much, I need to ask myself this question. Did I draw all the forces? And it's a kind of a consistency check that you are doing. And as you're doing consistency check, I hope you notice this that your net force is kind of going this way, uh, to the down and to the left. And um, this is where you have to kind of exercise and use your intuition. As you look at this cart, you saw me draw this arrow to the left. That was the direction for acceleration and that seemed to make sense. But when you look at this uh, direction of net force here, what it says is that that's the direction of acceleration and that just uh, can't be right. And what that is telling you is that you didn't draw all the forces. So the answer to the question, did I draw all the forces is a no. So you need to slow down, pause, think about it. Did I forget any forces? Hopefully pretty quickly you realize, oh, I forgot about the normal force. So you need to draw the normal force. So let me draw the normal first here, N1. And now I ask myself the same question. Did I draw all the forces? Um, I have these forces vertically and I'm reasonably confident that I can arrange them in a way that they cancel out so that I will end up with the acceleration pointing to the left. So that all seems to make sense. So now I can answer to myself, yes, I did draw all the forces. 
So once you are able to say that, then you move on. And once you can convince yourself that you drew all the forces, then that's kind of where you stop. You don't have to look for any additional forces. And the reason I like to go in this order that I draw the forces as I see the uh, need for their existence is I'm trying to avoid the mistake of drawing the forces that don't exist. Uh, what we sometimes call pseudo force or um, you know, while you are in the process of developing your intuition, uh, that kind of check is important. That um, recognizing when you don't, uh, what you maybe are thinking of as a force, because you associate with a sense, with associate that with the sensation of force, may not actually be a force. Okay, so I'm done with M1. Let me move on with the M2, the hanging mass. So I go through the same process again. I think I say this in many of the videos. This step number one, it's the most time consuming step, or if not the time, most time consuming, it's one that requires the most thinking. It's the one where you have to constantly ask yourself and just make sure you're not making mistakes. Because if you do this first step wrong, you're kind of done. The rest of the step, you can do steps two, three, four, perfectly, but if you have a wrong free body diagram, then um, whatever you do, you, there's a good chance your answer will be wrong. So, um, okay, so <laughs> I've scared you enough. Let me just continue on. So with M2, I'm going through the same process. One, I like to start with the forces I know have to be there. So um, there has to be gravity. So let me draw gravity downward, M2G. Um, and I notice again, there's a string attached to there. So there must be a tension force. So there's a tension force pulling it upward here, T2. All right. And, um, and I, uh, from my intuitive feel earlier, I thought it was going to be acceleration downward. And with these two vertical forces, I can arrange them in such a way that the acceleration will be downward. So, all right, that all seems good. So I still ask myself the question, did I draw all the forces? And my answer is, yeah, it looks like I drew, drew all the forces I know have to be there, and I can kind of make them work in a way that the acceleration comes out in the right direction. So I'm all done, no more forces needed. Okay, then, um, then I move on to step number two. I define coordinate axis. So this is where it's kind of helpful to have the direction of acceleration. Um, I guess uh, it's, and it's where you do have to be careful. I don't like to draw anything on my free body diagram that are not forces, because this is really a force diagram. And um, so that's why when you, see me draw acceleration, you see me draw it kind of way far off. I want to make sure that my acceleration won't be confused with the forces later. But anyways, um, so that's my direction of acceleration. On the second diagram, this is my direction of acceleration. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make this my direction of uh, plus x. And I will just define my y-axis in some way that's perpendicular. And um, so this, these axes that you're defining, you can define them for each free body diagram. So I defined it this way here, and I don't have to define it the exact same way for my second free body diagram. So I'm going to use that freedom to say, this is my positive x direction. And, um, and I guess I can also define the y direction, but um, in the second diagram, there's no other um, axis that I really need to worry about. All right, so that's step number two, define the coordinate axis. And step number three is to break forces into components. For this uh, simplified setup, uh, I don't actually have to do that. All my forces are already along the direction of an axis, so they are already the component. So I don't have to do anything about that there. But the examples you see in the recorded video do show you how you should break forces into components. Finally, Step number four, I write down uh, Newton's second law equations. And as you do that, so if you've done steps one, two, three correctly, then all that step four consists of is basically reading off the information 
that already lives in your free body diagram into the system of equations that's given by Newton's second law. There's no real creativity involved there. It's just a mechanical step of translating what's in the diagram into the uh, mathematical equations. So uh, what I do know is I need to write down um, what I need to write down one equation per diagram and per axis. So uh, with, a, with a two objects and potentially two dimensional problems, uh, I will be writing down potentially four equations for this particular problem. So uh, let me do that. So I'm going to need to write down the um, equation for diagram one for directions x and y and equation for diagram two uh, potentially for directions x and y. And you know, some of this will simplify, but let me just uh, lay this all out so that I don't forget anything. So okay, uh, number one in the x direction. So what I have is acceleration in the x direction, that is actually just the A that I labeled, is equal to the net force. Um, I only see the tension force in the x direction, so that's going to be my sole single force for the net force. So tension, T1, divided by mass. And here you want to be careful that you use the mass for the object. So it's not some abstract mass, it is at mass M1. So this is M1 here. So this is my first equation. I wrote down acceleration is equal to net force divided by the mass. Let me write down my second equation along the y direction. Here, um, so this is why we did the step number two the way we did it. The way we did the step number two ensures that kind of Acceleration for one of the two directions will be zero. So acceleration along the y direction here is zero. So I can say zero is equal to the net force. So the normal force minus the gravitational force, M1 minus M1g divided by the mass, M1. All right, that's equation number two. Uh, let me do equation number three, which will be for free body diagram two, direction x. So I have uh, the so acceleration, which is in the same direction as my positive x direction. So acceleration is equal to the net force, m2g minus t2. m2g minus t2 uh, divided by the mass. Uh, in this case, it will be m2 mass of the object for which you are writing down the Newton's second law equation. And finally, uh, for the y direction, um, there's really nothing to write down. I mean, if I wrote it down, it'll be basically zero is equal to zero because there's no acceleration in that direction and there are no forces in that direction. So let me not do the boring thing and just to skip that part. Um, so I have three equations for three directions for which there's anything going on at all. Um, and you know, in fact, uh, looking at this, what I'm going to be realizing is that all that this direction does is it lets me figure out what N1 is. But um, this normal force N1, it doesn't look like it's something that I'm interested in in any case. So I think what I'm going to do from this point on for the remainder of the question is I'm just gonna ignore this equation because all that it lets me do is figure out N1 and I don't care about N1. It doesn't give me any information that I want anyway. So, um, so I'm just gonna be ignoring the two questions, uh, equation number two. So I really have only equations one and two to worry about. Uh, now this won't necessarily be the case uh, for the uh, homework questions that you are working on for the, the following Monday, uh, where, that's where you have friction involved. Um, this is why I kind of looked at these two equations before I crossed this out. I was looking to see if uh, um, these two questions had the potential for involving normal force, and they didn't. So that's why I felt comfortable saying that I don't care about normal force. But, you know, beware for more advanced questions. 
So I have two equations, and at this stage, uh, my application of the standard strategy is done. This is kind of the end of the standard strategy, and this is the point at which I now look at what the questions are. Oh, I need to find the acceleration, and oh, I need to find the tension, and try to see if these give me adequate tools in answering those questions. And the, the very first thing to see, do to see if it does that is to count your unknowns and equations. Or let me write this down. Uh, count number of equations and unknowns. And this is the point where I want to remind you of something that you might have uh, learned in your uh, algebra class. I guess this would have been your intermediate algebra. It's a kind of general fact that if you have a system of equations with, let's say, two unknowns, then you need uh, two equations to properly define that system of equations and be able to solve for your two unknowns. If you have a system of equations with the three unknowns, then you need exactly three equations. If you have fewer than three, then your system is underdefined, and um, then you have infinite number of solutions. If you have more than three, then your system is overdefined, and you better make sure that, or you better hope that some of your equations are dependent on each other, so that um, so that uh, you can kind of reduce them down to three equations. So the reason for counting the number of equations and unknowns is to make sure that uh, you have correct number of equations, which represents information you know, as the uh, number of unknowns. So here I have two equations. So I'm hoping I have two unknowns, so I should count and check. So I have acceleration. That's my first unknown. I kind of need to solve for it, so I don't know it. Oops. And looking at my list of things, I don't know tension one. So all right, that's my second unknown. I know the masses, or I'm going to pretend that I know. It's some, you know, cart. It's something I can measure in lab. Uh, acceleration, I don't know it, but I already counted it, so I don't need to count it again. M2, I'm hoping I know that. Um, T2, hmm. Okay, I don't think I know tension T2. So that's the third unknown. And M2, that's fine, I know it. So. Looking at it right now, I have um, three unknowns and two equations, so I'm potentially in a problem. And uh, I said that I'm labeling this as with the separate variables to practice good problem-solving hygiene. And what I'm referring to there is making sure that when you have distinct quantities, you use distinct labels. It's like using the labels M1 and M2 for the two masses. If you just use the label M for both of them, then there's a very good chance that you will get, confuse yourself um, when you are writing down your equations. And this tension in this part of the string and the tension in this part of the string, they are potentially um, different values because it's two different parts of the string. They don't necessarily have to be the same. That's why I labeled them as different. And this is where I kind of want to come up with a physical reason for justifying that uh, these are the same value and I can write them down as one T and kind of reduce my number of unknowns down to two from three. And uh, if you look at the original lecture question, then um, it has this thing, which is really the justification for it, the, the expression massless pulley. And this is something that we are not able to explain at this stage. I think we need to get to your um, exam two material to explain this. Um, um, it's a, it's when you have a massless pulley, and their rotational inertia is zero. So we can say that the tension on one side is the same as tension on the other side. So this uh, phrase, massless pulley, allows to, us to justify uh, what we are going to do. Say that the way this uh, situation is laid out, we are going to have T1 is equal to T2. 
And if you want, you can count this as your third equation and your bingo shape. You have three equations and three unknowns. Uh, but let me not overcomplicate this for myself and I'll just uh, change the labels for T1 and T2 and say it's a tension T1, a magnitude for the tension throughout the string. And for this particular case, that happens to work out because the way the arrangements are made with a massless pulley, the tension on one side will be the same as the tension on the other side. So, so okay, then now this uh, uh, satisfies our check, counting the number of equations and unknowns, and that tells us that, all right, we have all the information we need. Equations represent information. So now we have the same uh, amount of information, two equations, as what we need to solve for, two unknowns. So we are able to solve for it. So um, here the rest of the steps are algebra and uh, the kind of the algebra technique I like to use over and over. And I say this in other videos and the reason I like it is because it always uh, works. It's a simple, you don't need to get too fancy. And the method is uh, a substitution. So you uh, solve one of the two equations for one of the two unknowns and you use that solve the expression to, um, as a tool. And here, I think uh, one of the temptation might be to look at this and say, oh, it's already solved for acceleration. Let's use that. Uh, I would just caution you away from that because um, it's kind of a rule that you should remember for yourself in solving for a system of equations is that if you're interested in one quantity, acceleration, that's the last quantity you want to solve for. Because whatever quantity I solve for right now, I'm going to be eliminating it. So I won't be able to solve for it until a little bit later. So what I want to actually do right now is solve one of these two equations for tension so that I can eliminate tension. Uh, so let me actually do that with equation one. So solving it for tension, I'm going to get uh, tension is equal to M1 times acceleration. And this is going to be the tool, let me call it one prime, that I use to eliminate tension from the rest of the system of equations. Uh, in this case, that's equation two, and I see tension there, and I can plug this in, substitute it for tension to have a single equation in terms of a single, uh, in terms of a single unknown, acceleration and solve for acceleration. So plugging this into equation two, I get this. Um, acceleration is equal to M2G minus, and instead of tension, I plug in M1A, M1A divided by M2. Now I have an equation with, well, one unknown in two different places. Um, and one equation, so I just solve for acceleration. And this is where you kind of need your algebra practice, kind of know what the next thing to do is. Uh, here, what I want to do is I want to collect like terms of the acceleration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply through by M2 to get to M2 times A is equal to M2G minus M1A and collect the like terms by moving M1A over. So I'll get M2A plus M1A is equal to M2G. Now I can factor out acceleration. Um, oh, let me kind of save some space in doing that. So factor out acceleration. Then now as a final step, I can solve for acceleration by uh, moving this M1 plus M M1 plus M2 over to the other side. So I get acceleration is equal to M2G divided by M1 plus M2. And that's it. That's the answer for the acceleration. And you know, you plug in the numbers. So in the lab, you do measure M1, possibly M2, plug them in that will give you your prediction for acceleration. And to uh, solve the, uh, the other question of what the tension is, uh, you look at, oh, I have this intermediate result here, 
where I solved for tension. So I can actually plug this, uh, let me call this three, into uh, one prime to get tension. Uh, let me do that. I'm going to scroll down a little bit and um, do that, actually. Uh, the reason I want to do that, even though I'm already over three minutes, uh, sorry, 30 minutes, is I want to kind of show you the value of um, simplifying things. Or here, uh, it's going to be already simplified, but let me just uh, highlight something <laughs> that I think is worth highlighting. So um, plugging in, um, so I'm going from one prime, plugging in three into that. Uh, what I get is tension is equal to M1 times M2G divided by M1 plus M2. Um, all right, I mean, I guess that's an analytical expression. You can plug numbers into it, and it's kind of fine as it stands. And, but what I want to show is that these analytical expressions, they are powerful tools. Um, once you did all this work, you know, 30 minutes of work, driving this analytical expression, they can actually give you ways to gain physical insight into the situation. So uh, let me kind of write down this tension in a form that I find the most uh, illustrative. That tension is equal to M1 times M2 uh, divided by M1 plus M2 times g. And there's a kind of a symmetry or and a lack of symmetry that you can see in here if you um, observe it. So um, going back up to here, you can kind of imagine this a situation. How would this setup be different if you were to swap these two masses? M1 with M2. Just a matter of curiosity, you know. You've got nothing better to do. You're just thinking about, hey, let's try changing things. How would that change things? If you swap M1 and M2, then with the acceleration, you get kind of a predictable thing. Oh, if I swap M1 and M2, that's just going to change about a bunch of things um, because this M2 in the numerator will become M1. Guess the denominator, denominator doesn't change, but well, you're changing the numerator. So your acceleration is gonna change a lot. Now, when you look at the tension, what you see is that if you swap M1 and M2, then nothing really changes. The numerator will stay the same. The multiplication, the order doesn't matter. So whether it's M2 times M1 or M1 times M2, who cares, it's the same thing. Same thing with the denominator, M1 plus M2 or M2 plus M1, it's the same thing. So what you're seeing is that the tension won't change when you swap the two masses. It's a, at least an interesting observation and um, you might be able to kind of figure out conceptually why that should be the case. But this mathematical expression at least gives you an entryway into uh, using math to help you develop your intuition. And uh, this is the kind of question that's difficult to ask on my open math. Like, what would I even ask? <laughs> um, so I just want to encourage you to uh, engage in the practice of doing that. Um, uh, having yourself think about, did my answer make sense? Or um, is there something I can gain from knowing this analytical expression? You know, not just something where you plug in numbers to, even though you do also do that. So, so that's the lab setup. And I think that's kind of all that we have time to cover. Uh, for the lab setup, um, I think you have the pre-lab and uh, encourage you to look at the pre-lab. And um, this is the kind of the resource that um, people who were taking this class in a 100% face-to-face format had access to um, as a, a virtue of having been able to cover the same lecture. So 